Okay, uh, uh, we'll get started. Uh, so, um, what we'll do now, uh, as I said before, we have uh, uh, Bob Desmond uh, coming from uh, uh, MIT, who's uh, uh, going to talk until uh, about 3.30, uh, and then we'll have a break, and then uh, Ed Voidin sitting over here uh, from uh, Fort Supply. So, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Bob Desmond here, who, uh, is a man who doesn't really need an introduction. He's been uh, really um, uh, changing our, uh, our viewpoints and, and, and illuminating our thinking about uh, visual attention uh, by virtue of these recordings in, in uh, Proud of Macaque uh, Ventral Visual Cortex. You, pr you already have heard his name as well in terms of the discovery of uh, face cells and his work with it. Uh, with Charlie Ross uh, uh, earlier in his career, and also more recently, uh, beautiful work uh, combining uh, functional imaging and, and, and energy. So, without further ado, so um, we could spend this entire course just on the topic of energy. So, I have quite a bit of material, but we don't have to get through it all. We can just get through as much as we get through. Uh, and we can discuss any, any point, interrupt, uh, have rebuttals, whatever. And, um, but I think we'll get an introduction to the work in the field. And, oh, I'm sorry, I have to turn it on. Um, so, it, it's, uh, whoa, this is like, what? Maybe you have this less, okay, booming, like the voice of God. I can? No, I don't think so. Oh, I see. Can we just, oh, is it, do you need it this loud? My gosh. How's that? Is that, is that better? Less God-like. <laughs> uh, so you know, there's a there's a there's an informal rule in neuroscience that you can't talk about attention without giving giving demonstrations of how uh, big an effect attention has on your consciousness. Okay, so so we will start off with some examples, and uh, all the good examples, of course, have been used up by all the people giving attention talks. So you may have seen one or more of these before, uh, but, uh, but for those who haven't, uh, oh, so what you're going to see in the next one is this big, big complex scene flashing on and off. It's called a change blindness demonstration. There is um, there's something changing in the scene from flash to flash, and you are just to um, mentally note when you uh, see the thing that's changing from, from flash to flash. Have you gotten it yet? Now, psychologists who have studied this have, have shown that the time it takes to find the change in the display is inversely proportional to IQ. I don't know if that <laughs> has encouraged anyone to look harder, but... Uh, oh, I see. There's, there's one smart person in the back of the room. Uh, but I could give you a hint. Maybe the airplane engine. You all see that? You all see that now? I hope none of you are pilots. Uh, so... Uh, so the point is that uh, all, this scene is stimulating your retinas this whole time, right? But somewhere between your retina and your soul, uh, the image of the airplane engine somehow got dropped out. And it wasn't because it wasn't the sensory stimulus wasn't there, but it was because you weren't paying attention to it. It was something inside your head. And if we were, had electrodes in your retinas, we could have determined that you were looking probably right at it, across it, and so on. Uh, at times, and again, weren't fully processing it. So, so okay. So then you think, okay. So something. This is a trick with um, with flashing images. So the next demonstration is a. Um, here, it was a mud flash demonstration. So with each mud flash, there's a, a change in the scene. So I'll get that. Yeah, you got that. I hope none of you are drivers in Boston. Um, so see that you see the line on the road. Going on, uh, right? Okay, so, um, okay, and finally, if you're still unpersuaded, uh, then the last demonstration who, who was given to me by uh, Oda Oliva at MIT, there's just gradual changes that occur in the scene. Okay, so you're just going to see gradual change and just mentally note if you see something gradually changing.
Okay. So <laughs> did you all catch all those changes? All the people that appeared and disappeared, doors, windows, signs. Yeah. <laughs> they all, no, it was real. They all, they all changed. And, and since there was no temporal transient, uh, they, none of the changes attracted your attention, and so you didn't see them. So, uh, psychologists that use these kinds of demonstrations, what's that? For a question, you play it again. Yeah. Uh, you want me to play it again? No, because you don't believe that it was <laughs> changing. Whoa! That's the first time anyone... Well, everyone usually... Usually that people don't believe what I say, but that's after I get to the science part of the talk. <laughs> All right? Believe me now? Actually... Who is it? I just saw somebody. Oh, I saw Marvin Chun give this talk where he gave a change blindness demonstration, and it was great because everyone he studied and so they couldn't see it, and then he told them actually there was no change. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best. <laughs> okay, so so now that I've convinced you that something important goes on inside your head that determines what it is you really see. Uh, now we're going to talk about how that comes about. And, um, and the system that we study in mostly monkeys, but also humans to a certain extent, is the visual pathways, which assume you have heard something about, right, so far this meeting. Yes, okay. Uh, and for the object recognition system, which is the one that's relevant for this recognition of objects, um, you know, it starts in D1, it goes down through the temporal lobe, and um, it, uh, as there's a progression, elaboration of features along the pathway, uh, this pathway gets inputs from the pulvinar uh, and from and gets feedback inputs from the parietal cortex and the prefrontal cortex, and we'll be talking more about that later. Uh, but somehow, in the actions of the system, um, perception and its modulation by attention takes place. Okay. So one of the other things that we know about the properties of the system is that as you go from D1 down into the temporal cortex. Uh, receptive field size gradually increases from to the pixel size in D1 to the whole room in the temporal cortex. Uh, and that one characteristic of this processing pathway is both a, um, a blessing and a curse. So the blessing is, as you may have heard from some other talks, is we think that this, uh, these large receptive fields contributes to our invariant recognition of objects. So you can have objects positioned anywhere in, in the in the retinal field, and the cells will still be driven, or objects can be different sizes, and, and so on. So um, the cells essentially get a view on objects that is resistant to these kinds of um, changes in objects that aren't relevant for their, um, their object identity. But on the other hand, the problem, as we'll see, with these large receptive fields is that now you can have more than one object in the field at the same time. Okay, so that raises a computational problem for um, any model that attempts to understand our ability to recognize objects. And so why is that? And this, we're now going to move into an experiment that was done in collaboration with Ethan Myers, who's sitting in the back of the room and you have presumably interacted with during the course. Uh, and um, Ethan, in fact, did all of the analyses that I'm about to show you on all the neurons that were recorded in this experiment. And there's also a collaboration with uh, Tommy Pojo and Ying Zhang. Okay, so what's the, um, what's the computational problem that's caused by these multiple objects in the receptive field? So, what, so now we have to come from, what, how, how do we think object recognition uh, comes about? And the general framework that we had developed over many years for thinking about recognition and attention in the ventral stream was what we call it biased competition. Uh, and the general idea was that objects uh, like the car would be represented by a pattern of neural activity in the temporal cortex with different neurons representing different features uh, of the object. And um, if you had another object, it's the same population of neurons, it's just be a different pattern of, acti act of activation across those neurons, because again, different features, okay? The problem comes when you have more than one object, because now, if they're stimulating the cells at the same time, in principle, they could um, they'd be activating all the same cells at the same time. And so now the neural code for any one object is now sort of confused or muddled because you now have the same neurons representing features 
simultaneously present, but in different objects. Okay, so, so the idea was that clutter would degrade this representation, but that the reason we have this attentional system, one of the reasons, would be to, um, to isolate the focusing on just, uh, sorry, the focus processing on just one of the objects so that uh, you could then have, you would get back the code for just that one object. Okay, so that was the basic idea. Um, and um, this, is, um, this is the equivalent in, in, ob in, a, in a computer recognition program for objects. You put a bounding box, say, around your objects and just run your recognition algorithms on what's inside that box and not the whole scene at the same time. And then, then your ability to recognize an object in that box would be uh, enhanced. Okay. Um, all right. So, what was the experiment that was used to test this, this idea? The idea had been talked about for a long time, but we actually never tested the computational implications of this. So, as I said, um, Ethan took the data we had collected from monkeys who were uh, looking at objects on the screen and um, and you take the, um, each object would create a pattern of activity in the recorded of neurons, and then you would have to send it through a pattern class classifier that would then learn the association between the object and, um, and the pattern of neural activity. So different objects would have different patterns of neural activity, and you can make predictions about whether um, the, uh, the pattern classifier was, had learned it properly, so you'd uh, know whether uh, you are correct or incorrect, and uh, and so that was a basic idea. Is it, is it, this was known as in, in as envisioned now as a decoding kind of, of um, model. You take a lot of the data from the population and use it to decode uh, what the animal or person is seeing at that time. And here the relevant in, in the experiment from the monkey's point of view is the um, monkey would be fixating a spot and. And this, and this and I think all, almost all the experiments that I'm going to tell you about today, uh, we are holding fixation constant and just varying covert attention. So you know you can you can keep your eyes fixated on a spot, but you can attend to things off that spot. Uh, and although it seems somewhat unnatural, in fact, you're moving your attention before your eye movements all the time. Um, and so your your eyes still your attention moves, and then your eyes moves later. So we're we're making use of that covert attention in these kinds of experiments. So monkeys uh, fixating a spot, and then uh, either one or three objects would appear in the receptive field. And uh, after the objects appeared, a tiny little dim line would point towards one object. Uh, and the, that would, that, through training, the animal would know that's the object it should pay attention to. Because at some random period of time, that object will change color slightly and the animal would make a saccade to it. And then on another trial, it would point to another object and so on. And then you can measure this decoding performance uh, all through the, um, in, in time windows, all through the trial. And the objects that were used were, um, were cars, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, faces, and furniture, which, as you know, are the four major classes of objects in the universe. Uh, so we can completely generalize to any object from one of these four classes. Uh, but it was a test, at least to get started. Okay, and as I said, uh, we're going to measure coding performance in this uh, window. This is going to be measured with the area under the ROC curve. The one is perfect classification of 0.5 chance. So if you have just a single object in the receptive field, here we're now looking at the population decoding performance. Uh, and um, this is the time zero is when the stimuli come on. Uh, and uh, at time at 500 milliseconds, the tensional cue comes on. But when there's only a single object in the field, we're assuming the animal is attending to it to the, the whole time anyhow, and there's nothing to, there's no other distractors to block out. So that's sort of the baseline performance. So now let's see what uh, happens when you have, now you're adding three objects simultaneously. Okay, and the red and green lines now show the decoding performance when um, you're trying to decode the, the, uh, the identity of the object, the animals that Q and Q to attend to, say this one, uh, and the green one is green is when he's been cued. So sorry for the decoding of one he's not been cued to attend to, and you can see. So here's the cues comes on as soon as the cue comes.
Um, the decoding performance for the attended object goes up, and the decoding performance for the unattended object goes down. So that's exactly what we were hoping to see. Um, the decoding performance for the, the attended object in clutter never goes up to what it would be if the object was there by itself. So attention moves you towards performance for a single object in an isolated scene, but it's not as good as actually not having any distractors at all. So one lesson from that is you're trying to focus on something and keep yourself you know, away from distractions. It's better to physically remove them than to try to just block them out using your attention all the time. Yes? You might get to this, but is it that it increases the gain of some subpopulation of neurons, or is it like inhibiting the non-selective population? Right. So now you're getting into kind of models for how we, well, what, what do we think is happening uh, in the neural population that's causing these changes? And we're going to get to that very soon. Any other questions? Um, it's also activity to color in these neurons, which seems to be the relevant feature for the task. Like, can you... I'm sorry, this is... Oh, color. Yeah. So, in fact, in this, uh, in this example, they're actually colored objects. But in the, in, in the real experiments, and in the slides that I just shown you, they're all black and white objects. But the monkey has to report the color change? He has to report... He, he has to just re say when a color change occurred. Uh, and it's a very slight color change, so it forces them just to pay attention. Other questions? Okay. Now, what happens to the actual firing rates of the neuron? This is going to start moving us in the direction of, a, of the model. But um, So, in order to have a prediction about, or even track, what's happening to the, change, to the firing rates of cells, you've got to segregate the responses in some way. And the way that we and others have chosen to do this usually is to take whatever object we've shown and for a given neuron, we, deter we, de we, we um, determine which object elicits the best response for the cell. So this would be your isolated best object. When you present that object by itself, the, the neuron responds the best. And then you find an object that by itself is the worst object for the neuron. So let's say the neuron responds to a face, but not a couch. And so the best would be the face and the worst would be the couch, okay? So then we just track those responses over time compared to the mean. Uh, and the red, that's the red line is for the best and the blue line is for the worst. And, and um, now this is when you attend to the ice, to in clutter to the best or the worst. And here's where the cube comes on. And that purple line is the actual firing rate of the cell to the, um, to that, attended best object, and you see it jumps out really close to the response you would have had had the object been presented by itself, whereas the response to the um, worst object goes down. Now, it's isn't to say that it's being inhibited, but it would go down uh, in this, uh, on the scale. Okay. Oh, and just to say, one of the uh, kind of, uh, one of the things that in the experiment convinced us that um, we really were, in a sense, tracking the, you know, in, what was going on inside the animal's head in terms of what he was actually attending to. So here what we were uh, looking at was the, now we took the same data that I just showed you, uh, the firing, uh, with the, sorry, with the decoding accuracy, but now we synchronized it to the time of the color change of, the, of a distracting object. So let's say the animal is attending to this object, and then something changes color over here. So now we just resynchronize the data to that point. Okay, and here, this is the decoding performance for that attended object, which is getting really good up to the time that now the distractor all of a sudden changes color. And now you see the decoding performance for the object he was attending to drops down. And then all of a sudden the decoding performance for that distractor that changed color jumps up. Um, and so what do we think is happening right here? Well, what we think is happening is that that color change of the distractor actually attracted the animal's attention momentarily. And for that brief moment, his temporal cortex was reading out, instead of the thing it should be reading out, it was now reading out the properties of the distracting object. Does that make sense? 
So it's like when you know, you're, you're focusing on something and then something happens across the room, something salient attracts your attention. For that brief moment, your brain is, actually, is processing the distractor, not the thing that you're, you had wanted to process. Okay. So now, there are a number of neuro, there have been a number of models that have been developed uh, for how these uh, response changes could come about. And um, they all have an aspect called normalization about them, which is that in order to under, understand the, the response uh, to a given stimulus, you've got to divide by uh, the inputs from a lot of different stimuli, so that the more and more stuff you have in the environment, the bigger the divisor, and the more you would pull down the response, which is basically keeping the response within a fixed range. Otherwise, just keep adding stuff in the visual field. The response can, can just keep going up indefinitely. And, um, and you take that basic normalization idea and apply it to multiple stimuli in the receptive field. You had something like this. This is a model that John Reynolds developed in my lab now many years ago. Uh, and the model was basically this. You'd have a target neuron that gets inputs from uh, neurons at an earlier level of the visual stream, uh, and, uh, and that these inputs were at a combination of excitatory and inhibitory weights. And the reason one stimulus might be good and another might be poor for a cell is the good stimulus could have a greater ratio of excitatory to inhibitory weights than a poor stimulus. So here you have your two, two competing stimuli and one neuron is reset the field, and uh, the response to these inputs is a weighted sum of all the inputs, and then with just a, um, oh, sorry, this is without attention, and just, just the weighted sum of all the inputs, and that, what that gives you at a population level is a kind of, of average response to all the stuff in the receptive field. And then, in this model, all you, the, the attention is simply um, model as an increase in, of, in the weights coming in from that attended stimulus. If you just increase the weights, then the neuron's response now becomes dominated by the inputs from, from that stimulus. And if it's a poor stimulus for the cell, that will drive the, stim the cell's response down. And if it's a good stimulus for the cell, it'll drive it back up to the rate it would have had um, had it been there by itself, depending on the strength of that attentional bias. And, um, and again, you can shift back and forth in the model. And quantitatively, the effects come out pretty similar to what's measured from neurons. So if you look at the response to a stimulus as a function of contrast uh, with, with and without attention, uh, the, um, the biggest effects of attention in that model is to shift that contrast response function to the left. So it's as though the stimulus has a higher contrast. Uh, and, um, and so the biggest attentional effects are found at low contrast. And, and in fact, that is what's found physiologically and then if you take the condition where you have, um, let's say, a preferred and non-preferred stimulus in the receptive field, and look at those responses as a function of contrast, here you have without attention the response to the preferred and the response to a non-preferred. And when you, act, when you put them together, this is sort of, again, this is sort of the average, but the exact where you, where you fit in this range depend on the model parameters and the strength of those inputs. Um, but if you now attend to the... Um, to the preferred, uh, the um, response will go up closer to the preferred by itself, and if you attend to the non-preferred, the response will go down closer to what you'd have the non-preferred there by itself. And, and now you'll see in the literature there's a number of, of other models. There's a more recent one from Reynolds and here, which I'll talk about in just a moment again, uh, but also from the lab of John Mansell. Uh, and Tommy Poggio has a soft max model, which has a normalization component to it. Um, all these normalization models, as it turns out, have similar behavior. Uh, and so the field has converged on this basic idea of, uh, of normalization. But I have, so one, but I have to say one real advance of the Reynolds and Heger model is it takes, compared to just the ones that, that treat the uh, tended and unattended stimuli, it takes in a lot of spatial parameters. So you may run across this model in literature, and it has to do with uh, the receptive, not only just the receptive field, but also what's in the surround, and it has to do with the size of the attentional field, which is never modeled before, so you can have a wide attentional field or a narrow field, and you can have a small stimulus or you can have a big stimulus. And in this model, all of those are important parameters 
that will affect how the cells respond to stimuli. And people doing neurophysiological studies are now working through those kinds of variations in stimulus and tension field and so on, and testing the model's performance with all those different variations. And so far, the, the, the Reynolds and Heger model seems to, to me at least, to be standing up pretty well to predicting the effects of these spatial parameter changes. Um, there's also uh, a lot of work uh, going on in the visual, in the cortex, uh, the visual cortex in particular, but also the somesthetic cortex in mice, uh, looking at the, the really detailed biology of what produces these um, normal response gains and response gains with normalization and response shifts and so on. Uh, and just, I just took one example from the literature, which is from Ragan Sur at MIT, who uh, is using all the new methods for genetically targeting cells. So you can now image particular classes of neurons in a, in a two-photon imaging experiment. And you can track the activity of neurons uh, that have been uh, identified this way. And you can look at things like the response gain as a function of contrast and look at the, um, how these curves change when you activate different populations of neurons. So for example, different classes of inhibitory neurons. And just in this one study, the parvalbumin-containing cells change the, um, the gain of that uh, response contrast uh, function. Uh, and, uh, so, and they are, unlike what we saw in the normalization model, the biggest effects are actually at the highest contrast, whereas if you activate another type of cell, in this case the somatostatin-containing inhibitory cells, then actually it looks more like a shift in the curve, or maybe more like what we saw in, the, um, in those uh, models that we were just looking at. And, um, and in fact, so a lot of it, there's been a lot of attention now on the, the role that inhibitory neurons might have in those, um, in those computations. Uh, and a lot of that work was really encouraging uh, but these are still early days, and I just and this is a I put up this slide from from Karen Dini, who uh, looked at these contrast response functions while blocking uh, all GABA transmission in the cortex with or these GABA receptors in the cortex with GABAzine, and of course none of the effects are what you would have predicted uh, by knocking out all the inhibitory cells. So he didn't get uh, in this in this model uh, uh, he got he got he got you got just shifts up and down of the curves, which wasn't what, this isn't the effect you would have predicted from any one of those cell types in isolation. And that's just to show you that uh, there's still a, a lot of work that needs to be done, but we're moving in the direction of really having the biology of all these circuit computations in cortex, with these now being able to use these methods and the kinds of methods that um, Ed Boyd is developing for this optogenetic control of neurons for testing the roles of different cell types. Any questions or comments? Okay. So now I want to uh, move on to another topic, which is uh, one that is debated in the field, one um, that I have I'm going to present some evidence to you about, and that's the role of synchrony in all these atten attentional effects that I've just described. Um, so far, everything I've told you has just been based on the average firing rates of cells, which is the standard way that people uh, look at processing in, in the cortex and the brain, for that matter, uh, just averaging firing rates over some period of time. But there's lots of evidence now accumulating from different neuroscience studies that it's not just the average integrated rate over some hundreds of milliseconds that's really important in neural processing, but it's this actual... Um, structure in the spike trains at, at fairly narrow scales in the range of milliseconds as opposed to hundreds of milliseconds. And to a certain extent, um, this has to be true given what we know about the temporal integration properties of neurons. So if, neuro, if a neuron gets, say, different inputs from different cells, it, it, it can't integrate them over infinite periods of time. If one input comes in here and another input comes you know, later, uh, as far as the cell is concerned, it just treats them independently. If, however, if they come in very close in time, then they will um, respond to the cell, will summate those different inputs. Okay? And so the question is, how close in time do those inputs have to be before you see that kind of summation? And the answer is probably different for different cells in different circuits, but 
They're all on the order of milliseconds and tens of milliseconds, probably then seconds. Um, so here's an example of how synchrony could affect responses of a cell in the temporal cortex, like the one that we described in those um, decoding experiments earlier, that gets inputs from populations of cells at an earlier level, say area B4. Uh, and so if you have this IT cell that's getting these inputs, and a typical cell will get over a thousand uh, different inputs in the cortex. Uh, if one population has the firing rates of cells in the population are asynchronous with respect to each other, random, but the other one has their, their firing rate synchronized so that in brief periods of time, all the inputs are coming into the cell in a, in a narrow temporal window, then you're more likely to push the spike over threshold during those periods and get an output out of the cell. So what you could say is that because of the synchronization, you have allowed one population of cell to control better the output of a, a downstream neuron. So um, we and a number of other people in the field have questioned whether such synchronous mechanism might play a role in attention as well. Now, when you talk about neural synchrony, some of you have heard about synchrony and the binding hypothesis. So let me just tell you what that was. It originated with Wolf Singer, uh, and he had a very particular problem that he spent a lot of time uh, worrying about, which was that um, we have neurons with you know, receptive fields distributed all over the visual field and different feature properties and so on. And the question was, how do you put all that information together? So um, this is a slide from one of his figures illustrating this problem. So here you have this, um, this sort of ambiguous face with the candlestick in front of it. And at one moment in time, you might see it as a face with a candlestick in front of it. But another moment in time, you might see it as just two profile faces facing each other, right? Okay. So, and then we know that um, back, let's say, in V1 or early visual cortex, there'll be neurons that have receptive fields, say, on the different sides of the face and on the, and on the, and on the candlestick itself. And his idea was maybe when you see the face as, say, an integrated face, what's happening is that the cells whose receptive field is on one side of the face have synchronized their activity with cells whose receptive field is on the other side. Um, and so now you get one face. But when you're seeing them as separate faces, maybe you've just synchronized the activity of cells that the receptive field are just in one profile or the other. And, and, the, and if they're going at different frequencies or different phases, now you might see them as different objects. And um, this idea uh, provoked um, years and years of experimentation and argumentation in the field. Uh, and uh, I would say that the consensus view now is that synchrony is not likely to be the solution to this binding problem. Um, but, um, but this idea frequently comes up, which is why I'm bringing it to you now. And I just wanted to alert you is this is not the same synchrony idea that we're talking about in the attentional experiments. And, and a lot of what you're seeing, if you see in the literature, people working on synchrony in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex and so on, they're not talking about synchrony as related to this binding problem, even though that's the most popular idea in the field. Synchrony has something to do with binding. Um, really, what I just described to you is that um, synchrony might play a role in increasing the gain of the impact of one population of neurons on another. So it's just a way of increasing impact and not necessarily binding different types of information. Is that clear? Okay, all right. So let's go back to this idea of synchrony and um, just talk to you to, oh, and, and talk to you, I mentioned that cells integrate information only, only uh, within narrow time windows, and that can be experimentally measured. I just put up this an example from the work of Jeff McGee um, who some years ago was measuring the temporal and spatial integration properties of dendrites in the hippocampus using the cage glutamate technique. So he could uncage glutamate uh, and, uh, and, and which would then um, depolarize portions of the membrane of the dendrites of the cell. And he could, um, he could either uh, have the inputs, close, he could vary their, how closely spaced they were in time or in space across the dendrites. The, um, in this plot here, what we're looking at is the response of the tel cell in terms of the membrane amplitude, uh, and, then, and then the number of inputs that cause that response. And the, the, um, the circles 
are when the inputs are closely spaced in time, and the triangles are measuring when they're uh, widely spaced in time. And you can see that for a given number of inputs, um, you get a higher output if the inputs are closely spaced in time. This is just telling you that cells have some finite integration property uh, that's going to affect how they respond to the stimulus. So this is, again, so if, if, you, if you think that this is general, then uh, it's not a matter of, of whether cells will be sensitive to the temporal structure of their input. They have to, they, essentially, they, they must be sensitive to the temporal structure of their input. Okay, so, um, so how could you test those role and attention? So in experiments that were done now quite a few years ago, uh, we recorded from neurons from monkeys uh, and, and at the same time recorded, uh, besides the, the action potential trains, also the, the local field potential and different electrodes. Um, and so you put bunches of electrodes in the cortex and you, you, had you had any discussion of the local field potential in the class so far? Yes? Yes? You did? Oh, you did. Okay, good. So the local field potential is measuring the general polarization state of membranes in, a, in some volume, which is still debated exactly how big that volume is. But, um, um, but if you're recording from a neuron, uh, the way you would separate out the local field potential from the spikes is just differentially filter it. So you could low-pass filter it to get the local field potential, which might look something like this. And if you high-pass filter it, you'll get out the spikes that look something like that. And one way of relating the, um, the, t the timing of spikes in the of, of one cell to the whole population is to look at that timing relationship of spikes to variations in that local field potential. And what many people find is that uh, if you average the local field potential around every spike, you get something called the spike-triggered average of the local field potential, and in most experiments it looks something like this where the spikes are occurring at a time of what would people think is the state of maximum depolarization in that local network. So when the whole network becomes more depolarized, not surprisingly, spikes tend to occur at that time. And we could debate whether it's the cause or effect of the change in the local field potential, but it's a fact that that's when spikes tend to occur. And you can see it has this oscillatory structure to it, a damped oscillation, which is telling you is there's some frequency relationship with the spikes to the field potential, uh, but it's not constant, which is why it's damped. Okay. Now, if you record from cells in um, that, an area that's intermediate along that pathway, and the animal either attends to it or not, uh, this is an area known as V4, uh, you get something like this in the firing rate histogram, and here's the spike-triggered average of the local field potential. In both of these figures, the red line is when the animal is attending to the stimulus, and the blue line is when the animal is ignoring the stimulus. So with attention, the firing rate of the stimulus goes up. And in addition, uh, you see this, uh, this, there's more structure in the local field potential and greater amplitude of that ringing. So you can analyze this using some measure of coherence. This is the phase locking of spikes to that local field potential, and which is what we've done here for a population of cells. Here's uh, coherence. The more coherence, the more phase lock. And here is a function of frequency components in that field potential. And you can see that in this range of about 40 to 70 hertz or so, with red being the attended condition, uh, there's more phase synchrony of spikes to the local field potential and in the unattended condition. And this is what's now been found in lots of studies. So uh, if you like the idea that uh, one aspect of the mechanism of attention is this increase in the temporal synchrony of cells, and this would be evidence that you like to see, that there is more temporal synchrony in a, in a range that puts spikes into the sort of sweet spot of the temporal window. You also see here in this low frequency regime, there's a suppression of, um, of synchrony to the low frequency components of low field potential. And we're not going to have a chance to talk much about that phenomenon today, but that's, that's in a whole other lecture. It's a whole other topic. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, um, in these uh, low-frequency effects of attention we could talk about later. Okay, so how does this, so this gamma synchrony in this sort of 30 to 70 hertz range, how does that come about? Well, there's a lot of work going on in the field right now looking at the biology of gamma rhythm, uh, but 
um, regardless of the details, um, they nearly all have the flavor of some kind of interaction between inhibitory cells and excitatory cells. And that the, the time, that the frequency of gamma, that's to say 40 hertz, is closely related to the time constant of the GABA-A receptor. And again, you could, you could wire this up in different ways, but basically if you were to activate the inhibitory cells, they would suppress the excitatory cells, but then they would rebound. So if you were, say, act, this is from electrically stimulating the inhibitory cells, you stimulate them, there's some inhibition of the excitatory cells, but then they rebound and they would burst. And then if there's some feedback of the excitatory cells and the inhibitory cells, well, then the inhibitory cells would shut off the excitatory cells again, and, and so on and so on. And you get some sort of oscillatory structure here. And the frequency of the oscillation would depend on all kinds of parameters, including the strength of the drive and so on, but it would get you up into that gamma frequency range. And um, besides the interest in this because of attention and other kinds of processing in the cortex, there's a lot of interest in these gamma mechanisms because they have been implicated in a variety of different brain disorders. There's some evidence of some problem with inhibitory cells and with some dis, um, dysfunction in these little GABA, gamma circuits. Okay. Oh, so now let's get to how the processing in this pathway is in fact uh, modulated by all these top-down attentional inputs. So when we train an animal and tell the animal, you know, tend here, tend there, whatever, what's causing these effects on the cells? And just before we, we get to the feedback, any other, again, let me make sure there's any other thoughts, questions. Okay. So the, um, the, the two brain areas that, that are most talked about in terms of their feedback role and attention are the parietal cortex and the prefrontal cortex. Um, there's a lot of interest in the thalamus as well, but we're going to focus on the cortex. Um, and, and it's known in humans that if you damage, uh, particularly in the right hemisphere, particularly in parietal, but also from, from prefrontal, if you damage these structures, you can get something that's called neglect, where people fail to attend to stimulate in the contralateral space. Have you all, you all heard about neglect and you know, you've heard of, of people that fail to attend to things in half the space and so on. So you get extinction syndromes where people can attend to things if there's just one thing in the visual field, but if you put a competing thing in the other visual field, then, they, then they, the thing in the bad field will disappear. So there's certainly some important, you know from the lesion evidence, there's some important role of these areas in the control of attention. And, and uh, Kieran Moore, uh, in the monkey side, has really done a remarkable series of studies using electrical stimulation, which is sort of the opposite of the lesion. But he's used electrical stimulation to um, show that the frontal eye fields in, in the prefrontal cortex in particular plays an important role in mediating some of these visual effects of attention that you see back in visual cortex. So this is just an example from one experiment that Kieran Moore did uh, looking at this role of the electrically stimulation of the FEF cells while monkeys were um, in one of these kinds of attentional experiments. So here are the monkeys fixating a spot. Here's a receptive field of a cell in V4. And here you can put two stimuli in, the, in that receptive field. And one could be a preferred stimulus and one could be a non-preferred. And what Kieran did was he electrically stimulated in the frontal eye field at a representation that was either centered on, on one stimulus or the other in the same neurons receptive field. So you could stimulate and say focus processing here, or you could stimulate somewhere else in the FEF and say focus processing there. Does that make sense? And so instead of telling the animal to attend, you would electrically stimulate at that same spot. And um, here, yes? The fields in front of the eye roughly match the size of before? Like it's, uh, no, they're actually bigger. Um, and so, um, yeah, so it's an interesting issue. So they're, they're actually bigger, but if you electrically stimulate at a spot, the eyes will go to one very precise spot. So it's not like they go anywhere within one of these large fields. And the general thinking is of places like the frontal eye fields or the colliculus where you have big movement fields, is that any given location in the field is specified 
by sort of the intersection of fields that are only partially overlapping. So you can target a precise spot even using uh, a large field as long as it's a population quote. Okay. All right. Um, and oh, you no, know, I grabbed the slide, but this wasn't the one I thought. This wasn't the one I meant to grab. Okay. But in any case, um, so this slide simply shows if you had one stimulus in the field and you stimulated that spot, the cell would give an enhanced response to that stimulus. The slide I meant to put in here was going to show that if you stimulated the spot of the good stimulus, the response went up. But if you stimulate at the spot of the poor stimulus, the response goes down. So in other words, the cells were mimicking the effects of attention, except that they've been, all these effects have only been produced by electrical stimulation. So anyhow, there's a lot of experiments showing that the frontal eye fields should um, play an important role in the control of attention. So an experiment I'm going to tell you about now that was, that was done in my lab, um, there were simultaneous recordings in the frontal eye fields in area four. Um, and the task that the monkey used, I have, I've sort of glossed over the task, so it's a task that people use, so I'll, I'll, fix, I'll give you a little bit more detail off of right here. Uh, so the monkey's fixating a spot on the screen, and in all these experiments, you monitor the monkey's fix, fixation with uh, infrared video cameras. Uh, and, um, you, um, and you can put multiple stimuli on the screen, and in this experiment, Georgia Goryu, who did this, uh, did these recordings, he found a spot in the frontal eye fields in area B4 where the cells had overlapping receptive fields, like you see here. Uh, and then one stimulus would go in there, and then there would be two other stimuli on the screens, and they'd be different colors. And then, after the stimuli were on the screen, they just put some stuff. Okay, it's still, okay. Um, then the fixation spot would turn co a color, and that color would tell the animal which color grading it should attend to in that trial, because then at some random time afterwards, uh, that grading would, would itself turn color slightly, and then the animal would indicate it with a bar release, and then, and then it would get a reward uh, to his juice. And, um, and then you can change the color from trial to trial and change the position of the gradings and so on and so on, so everything's random counterbalance and so on. And you can look at the effects of, of the stimulus on the cells with and without the animal attending to it. Okay. Now, if you do that and you record the firing rate of cells in the frontal eye fields in B4, in both areas, when the animal gets the cue to attend in the receptive field, the firing rate goes up, which is the red line. And if the animal gets the cue to attend to the stimulus outside the field, um, you see the firing rate goes down. So there's actually there's a push in, in terms of the, 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 um, the readout of the cell's response, it can go in either direction, either up, below, or above the stimulated, previously stimulated condition. Uh, and, but the effects occur earlier in the frontal eye fields than before. And that's consistent with the idea that the frontal eye field cells are, are the controllers of the visual cortex. They do their thing first, and the visual cortex follows. And if you look at synchrony in these two areas, both areas show effects of attention on synchrony. So they show enhanced activity in the gamma frequency range when the animal attends to the stimulus in their field. And furthermore, if, now this is the interesting thing, is you look across areas, then the effects of synchrony are even bigger across areas than within an area. So a, in either direction from E4 to FEF or FEF to D4, there's a very strong enhancement of synchrony across the two structures with attention. So a cell in one area is firing when the other cells are at the right phase of their response. It, and it's highly selective for just the cells that have the overlapping receptive fields. So if you take um, cells with overlapping fields and measure synchrony, then the effects of attention are very big. But if you look at cells who have different receptive fields in the two areas, look at synchrony across those, there's no synchrony and there's no increase in synchrony with the tension. So you've got to have everything lined up for it to work. And it's also specific for the type of cell in the frontal eye fields. The frontal eye field has some cells that are uh, purely movement. They respond just before saccades. Uh, you have some cells with mixed properties. And then you have a lot of cells that we call visual cells. They actually have visual responses. And if you look at the synchrony of the visual cells with the V4 cells, they're strongly modulated by attention, 
but none of the, the visual movement and movement cells, there's no significant modulation. So they have to be, not only have to be the overlapping receptive field, but they gotta be the right cell type. And we know from anatomical studies that these visual cells uh, tend to be in layers two, three, and these are the cells that tend to project back the visual cortex, whereas the movement cells tend to be located in layers five and six, and those tend to be the cells that project down to the colliculus. So that's suggesting that, um, that the attentional system is making use of visual cells, but it's not just the output of movement cells that are involved in making saccades. This is an argument, this is a debate that's occurred with the field for many, many years. Is spatially directed attention really just the ocular motor signal but with some sign of suppression of the eye movement itself? And this is the kind of study that would suggest that actually it's different cell types involved in these two different functions. Does that make sense? Okay. Right. Okay. Um, now, one thing that you can look at to get an idea of uh, the timing relationship between the two areas. So I told you the synchronous activity, um, but I didn't tell you about what's the phase relationship uh, in activity between the two areas. So um, one possibility is that the, uh, you could have a constant phase across frequency between the two areas. So uh, it could be, for example, they could fire at the same phase as each other. Um, or you could have some phase shift between the two areas. Um, and it turns out that when you actually measure this phase relationship between the two areas, um, it varies across frequency. So it's at one phase, this is showing the phase at the, in gamma, and this is in beta, and this is in theta, and you can see at every frequency it's a different phase. But the, the really striking things that came out of this analysis was that if you, at every one of these phase relationships, if you convert it to milliseconds, it comes out to the same number of milliseconds. So in other words, there's a constant time shift between the two areas. So it has to translate into a different phase at different frequencies. So we're gonna come back to this type of analysis, but it's a kind of analysis that's been used in other kinds of studies and with other kinds of data. But at this kind of looking at this, these, the timing of phase relationships and tell you something about the um, interaction part between the two areas. And what we have argued is that this constant time relationship is the time that's needed for spikes to actually get from one area to another. And then it's the conduction time plus the uh, synaptic delays uh, between one area and another. Um, and that uh, when you have this constant time, it means that cells in one area can fire, and by the time the spikes get to the next area, they would arrive at the time that this population was in its depolarized phase, so that they were most likely to have an impact on these cells. You can imagine the cells over here fired, and the cells over here happen to be in the hyperpolarized part of their, of their firing phase. That would, they, may not, they may not respond to inputs at all, but if they're depolarized, then those new inputs might push them over threshold and they'll fire. And likewise, and you can go back and forth and back and forth this way. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, then I'll skip that. All right. So, yeah, good, we're good on time. So, everything I told you up to now had to do with spatially directed attention. And um, that's sort of the most natural as I said, you move your spatial attention before uh, you move your eyes. It's what people think about and so on. But we know that people can attend to what we call features and objects irrespective of their location. So, for example, if I ask you to find the girl in the pink shirt in that scene, you can do that, right? Okay. So, how did you do that? Um, did you scan the scene? Um, and like a raster in the old CRT displays, and eventually it hit a girl in a pink shirt. No? Yes? You did that? <laughs> uh, and, you know, for the frontal eye fields, if, I, you know, if you tell a monkey, you know, attend to this one spot in the frontal eye field so it become active at that one spot, it's, you know, how, how difficult can that be for a brain, right? But if I, tell, if I just tell you to find a girl in a pink shirt, 
I mean, where does that come from? Where's the map of pink shirts in your brain? And where is it, you know, is there a map of girls versus boys? And how do you, where does that come from, right? And, and, and you had to use your knowledge of what shirts are like and what the color pink is like, girl wise looks like, and so on and so on. A lot, of, a lot of stuff went into that. And yet, you probably did it very quickly. Maybe just a couple line movements and boom, find the girl in the pink shirt. And, and this is something we do all the time. You are constantly guiding your attention through objects without necessarily knowing in advance where you should be attending to. And if you're like me, you're usually spending your time looking for the stuff that you've lost in the environment all the time, right? But, so you do this all the time, and you do it very efficiently. Uh, it's not that different than the question of, if I say, uh, imagine in your mind's eye uh, what a girl in a pink shirt might look like, or imagine what your mother looks like. You know, how do you do that, right? So you can use your long-term memories of these things, and you presumably have some way of loading it back up into your visual cortex, because there's lots of evidence that you actually do use your visual cortex during memory recall and imaging. So you have some way of getting back to visual cortex or something. And so our guess is it's a similar kind of mechanism. So how does that work? Um, and um, so I'm going to tell you about this, this one experiment that we published recently and trying to understand how that works. And then if there's time, I'll talk about a monkey experiment. Um, so the, um, in this experiment, uh, we use magnetoencephalography coupled with fMRI in people. Does everybody know what magnetoencephalography is? No. No. That's, that's, you've heard about it in the class before? Oh, they just have it. This is just, they grew up with you know, kids these days. <laughs> what they learn. Yeah. So if you have you know just if you have um, you know if you have neurons that are oriented along um, paths, and if they fire, uh, they will of course generate not only electric currents, but the currents tend to be along a, yeah, along a path that will generate a magnetic field. Right, it's the right hand rule. Uh, so you can tell which direction the magnetic field is pointing. Um, Right. You put your, you, which which way it's rotating, right? Um, and um, uh, and you know, in MRI machines, you induce magnetic changes uh, that affect the spinning of protons in your brain. So you have giant magnets. Uh, but in magnetoencephalography, it works it's the exact opposite of MRI in that you detect changes in magnetic fields. You don't induce them. And by detecting them. Um, you can, uh, you can through uh, trying to solve the inverse problem, which is of course in principle not not solvable in every case, but you can uh, try to approximate the sources of those magnetic field changes. Um, and one of the advantages that MEG has over EEG, which is another way of measuring the time course of neural response changes, is that with EEG. Uh, the electrodes are all attached to the same conductor, right? So you have, you have, you're trying to pick out electrical fields, but they're connected to your scalp, which is itself an electrical conductor. And so you've got to have very, very good models of the scalp and skull and so on to try to understand how those fields are going to be differentiated from each other. Whereas in MEG, all the detectors are totally independent, um, so it avoids the, that problem. Uh, and many people feel, therefore, that the localization you get is better with MEG, although that's still debated. Uh, but, in, in, but in modern MEG systems, they actually have EEG built in as well, so you can, in principle, always do both. Okay. So, now, in spatially directed attention, you have this great advantage in that you can uh, look at just different parts of these visual topic maps in the cortex and say, oh, what's, what happens when you attend there? What happens when you attend there? But for feature and object attention, uh, that's not so straightforward, right? So here, we, what we wanted to make use of was all the fantastic information on separate representation for different objects and features in the cortex. So particularly from the work of Nancy Kamlisher, who has been here, she's not here at this moment, um, she has shown, she had the earliest studies that showed that there is an area in the temporal cortex, the fusiform face area that's specialized for 
uh, the analysis of faces, and the parapsychical place area, specialized for the analysis of, of scenes, like houses and so on. And so we decided we would um, make use of those stimulus classes and looking at uh, object-based attention and, and um, how it's induced in the cortex. Nancy had previously shown with fMRI that you can modulate the overall activity in these areas as subjects attend to one stimulus and another. But we wanted to look at the timing of these activity changes. Now, with MEG, um, I said you can get some uh, localization of where the signals are coming from in the cortex. But what you'd really like is you'd really like a signal that could just tell you um, what stimulus is generating that signal. And the way, so the way that, that other people have done this is they've used something called, they sometimes call it steady state of potential or sometimes call it frequency tagging, is that if you present a stimulus class at a fixed frequency, you can actually pick up that frequency from the brain. Right? So if you say you have something going, bup, 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 or you, the brain signal will go, bup, 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 bup. and if you have two different things at the same time, which we're going to have in this experiment, um, you can just present them at different frequencies. And so if you see one frequency in the brain, and that's the frequency of one class, that must come from there, and the other frequency must come from the other. And, and we wanted to put the objects on top of each other because we didn't want the subjects to be able to use spatial attention. So this, the objects were faces and houses, and they were presented in these, this um, temporal sequence in which they were often uh, overlapping and, um, in time. Uh, and they were going, the stimuli were going in and out of phase sequence so that they were becoming more or less visible in a kind of sinusoidal pattern at these different frequencies. And the subjects are doing a one-back memory task so that forces them to focus their attention. Now, to tell you, show you what that actually looks like, here's an example here. So imagine that I've instructed you to attend to, let's say, phases, and uh, you were to, uh, to, to signal when one phase was repeated in that sequence. Okay, can you all do that? And because the stimuli are going sort of sinusoidally in and out of visibility, there's no sharp luminance transients, which have um, distortion effects in the frequency domain. Uh, and you can present them at different frequencies, and you can, of course, you would, um, you know, balance it. So you'd time the one phases would be at one frequency, and the house is at one, and then you reverse that. Okay. Now, so to get good, better localization than you normally can get from MEG, use uh, fMRI to localize these areas. So you just did a localizer task for the place and face area, and then we had the subjects doing that attention demanding uh, compared to a control task, and that. Uh, gave a significant activation in an area of the human frontal cortex known as the inferior frontal junction, which a number of other studies had shown are important for uh, working memory and general cognitive processes in the, in the human frontal cortex. Okay, so now we have some areas to focus our attention on in the MEG. Okay, so here's, here's what happens to the sensory signals as a function of what the subjects are attending to. Here's the power, and here's the frequency. And you can see, here's the face area, and here's the place area. And the blue lines when they're attending the faces, and the red lines when they're attending the houses. So you can see in the face area, that frequency for the faces is very, the power is very high when the subjects are attending the faces. Uh, and, um, and the power for the house is low when they're attending the houses. But in the place area, it's the exact opposite. So here the power is high when the subjects are attending to the houses and low when they're attending to faces. Does that make sense? So this is the modulation of the sensory response by attention that you would expect to see uh, from, from earlier work. Um, the, uh, the frontal eye fields didn't show a significant effect. It was not spatial. And here's this, but here's this inferior frontal junction uh, at where you, in the same area, you get... Um, the uh, attentional effects on faces, the face and house signals, but you see the attentional effects are even bigger here than back in the, in the um, temporal cortex. It's like almost all or none. So when the subjects attend to houses, you only see the house signal. There's virtually no place signal. And when the subjects attend to faces, you see the face signal. But there's virtually no house frequency there. So very strong. Okay. So um, this is all encouraging that maybe the IFJ is maybe involved in this task, but um, and we're going to get to just a moment 
the evidence for some interaction between these areas. But, but one of the things that um, is good about using these uh, signals that are sinusoidal is that you can just read out the fades of those signals very easily. And that, that phase tells you essentially a kind of latency for the area where you get the signal from. So V1, that phase translated into a latency of 162 milliseconds, and, and whereas the face in place area, it's about 20 milliseconds later, and about the, in the IFJ, it's about 20 milliseconds after that. So we would argue that this is consistent with a sort of 20 millisecond per level um, jumping in time, forward in time, as you go up the system with the sensory information from V1 up to the frontal cortex. Now, some people say, oh, that seems like a very um, late number for V1. V1 normally responds to stimuli earlier than that. But remember, this is, a vis this is the response to visibility. Uh, it's not to a luminance onset. And so um, you, can't really, you can't really compare these numbers to what people get to flashing things in uh, and measuring both response. Okay? But anyhow, but hold that number in mind, the 20 milliseconds. Okay, now let's look at something that's not locked to the stimulus. Now let's look that's not related to that stimulus frequency. Let's look up in the gamma frequency range. And now I'm just showing you here power in the gamma frequency range over time in the trial. And here, if you look, for example, at the face area and the place area, the, the reds when they're attending the houses and the blue the faces, and you, this is the start of the trial. And during the Q period, they're to, the subjects are told a little... Uh, character is fixation, what they should be attending to. And you can see that, and then during the, the fixation period, there's nothing on the screen, and then the stimulus period, the stimuli are on. So you can see that as soon as they get the cue, the power in gamma starts going up, as though, and, and specific for each area, as though the area is preparing itself for the stimuli that the subject's going to be attending to. And then it stays high through this, say this is like the working memory delay in the blank period, and then it just and it stays higher throughout the stimulus period. Um, again, with different, the opposite effects in the face and place area. In the IFJ, it, all, it shows the same um, temporal pattern, which, but it does show more gamma power for the tending to houses. And we don't know why that's true, but we speculate it's because it was harder for the subjects to attend the house. So we think the IFJ is like working hard uh, during attention to houses. But again, it's a speculation. Okay, so now let's look at interactions between areas. And that's look, now we're going to look at coherence. And here we're looking at coherence between the IFJ and the face area, and here between IFJ and the place area. And what this shows is that in the face area, you have this bump up in gamma frequency coherence when the subjects attend to faces. And in the place area, you get the bump up when the subjects are attending to places. And this gamma frequency coherence is, to us, the exact parallel to what we saw between the frontal eye field in V4 when the monkeys were attending to locations. And now it's for um, objects and people and, and this IFJ area as opposed to the, um, the frontal eye field. Does that make sense? So we would say that this is possibly the IFJ function to sort of the parallel to the frontal eye field in terms of how it is uh, interacting with these two areas. Now, I told you that um, as you go from one area to another, uh, up that hierarchy, uh, there's about a 20 millisecond jump as you go from area to area. What about the feedback, okay? In the monkey we saw, there was like a 10 millisecond time shift between the areas in, term in terms of feedback. And we could do exactly the same analysis in these human subjects where we look at the that the phase shift translated into milliseconds as a function of frequency. And uh, if you plot this um, in a, um, if you plot the, the change in time as a function of frequency, that, if, if it's a constant time, there should be a linear slope. And the magnitude of that slope will tell you how big the time shift is and the direction of the slope tell you which direction the interaction's in. And what this is telling us is that there's about a 20 millisecond time shift 
between the IFJ, these two areas, and the IFJ leads the, um, the activity in the face and place area. So we think that that, again, is the time it takes for activity sort of to get from the frontal cortex now back to the temporal cortex and with all the synaptic delays and so on. And we think 20 milliseconds could be just because the human brain is bigger. Uh, but again, we don't know that for sure, but that would be our interpretation of these, of these data. So you'd have this sort of optimal timing for activity across the two areas uh, to enhance processing attention to the appropriate object. So here's the parallel is um, we think that, again, from the monkey experiments, you have this synchronous interaction between the frontal eye fields and visual cortex, which is area B4. Based on spatially directed attention, you have cells with fire at the appropriate phase for the area it's coupled with. And we see the same kind of thing between the IFJ and the face and place area, uh, again, with the same kind of, of timing relationship. So we think it could be just sort of a common principle for how areas interact uh, in this, um, with attention, this feedback control system. Does that make sense? Any questions, arguments? Yes. Uh, what was the fMRI contrast you used to get the IFJ activation? That was, that was between um, the attention task itself, and then we had a, just a control, very difficult fixation task. It wasn't, it wasn't meant to be like the, you know, the best of all fMRI experiments to isolate attention, it just gave us some candidate areas to look at for in the MEG experiment. Uh, do you, is there like an obvious uh, candidate for an, an, an homolog in the monkey brain? Yes, we think. Um, so in the last few minutes, I can tell you about what we think is the homolog in the monkey brain. Uh, and it's an area that we started calling the VPA or ventral prearcuate, which is um, in, in the monkey is immediately in front of the frontal eye field. Uh, and uh, we have started recordings in this area. And unfortunately, we don't have the same ex um, experiment as we have in people. So you can't do a direct comparison in the same task. Okay, that's just how life works. But we do have a task which has been very, very helpful in separating out the effects of spatial and feature attention uh, in these monkey recordings. Uh, because there's, that's really the key for us is, is that separation between spatial and feature. And the task that we use is visual search. So it's more like looking for the girl in the pink dress and in the, in the pink shirt. So um, the monkey starts by fixating and then it gets a cue, which is different on every trial, but it shows an object that the monkey should then look for. This would be like pink shirt. Uh, and then there's a blank fixation period. And then when, this, when the array comes on, the monkey can look around anywhere he wants, but when he finally finds the thing that he's supposed to be looking for, he just holds his fixation there and he gets a root. Okay? Now, why is that a good experiment for separating spatial for feature? Well, for spatially directed attention, uh, you can just look at, let's say, the response to a stimulus when the animal is making an eye movement to it versus making an eye movement someplace else. So that's easy. Um, you know, attention before eye movement. Now, for feature attention, what you can do is uh, take a time period where the animal is moving, is about to move his eyes to, a stim to some stimulus. So, so say this one over here. But our receptive field is someplace else, like over here. And so the animal is not attending to it spatially. However, it may or may not have the thing that the animal is looking for. So let's say if he was looking for a pink shirt, there may or may not be a pink shirt in that field. So we can say, oh, how does the response to the pink shirt vary depending on whether the animal is looking for pink shirts or whether the animal is looking for blue shirts or something else or a shoe, whatever, right? And so we can compare those two situations, spatial, versus feature. Um, and uh, we were not the first to, to use this design. It's been used in a number of experiments in the frontal eye fields. OK. So if you record from DPA, compare it to the frontal eye fields, and we did some recordings in IT cortex, the, um, the VPA and frontal eye field cells have almost identical receptive fields. And this is shown in the sensitivity plot here. 
sizes are almost the same. IT receptive fields are much bigger. Okay, and now, but unlike the SEF, the VPA cells are also selective for the object features. So here, what we've done is we've taken the response to the best versus the worst stimulus for every cell. And, and the red line shows the best and the blue is the worst. And so IT cortex, of course, it has, it has very good sensory selectivity. Here's the best, here's the worst, very nice. Frontal eye fields, there is no best and worst because there is no feature selectivity. But in the VPA, sort of intermediate, there's pretty good feature selectivity in addition to that spatial selectivity. Yes? Is there a, is there a pinch of retinotopy in the inferior frontal junction? So um, in the monkey, uh, to us, it looks sort of random. Uh, unlike the F, in the FEF, there's a coarse topography to it. And in the VPA, uh, they all seem to be mixed in. The objects seem to be all mixed together, preferred objects, and the receptive fields also seem kind of random. So that's in general true of the prefrontal cortex. It's, it's a lot of mixed up stuff there. Okay. So now, by doing that manipulation that I showed you earlier, looking at feature versus spatial attention, we can look at the effects of feature attention and spatial attention on the responses. Now, in the, and this is the, the difference between the green, red, and blue lines here in the frontal eye fields and BPA. The rain, green and red line, that difference would show you the effects of feature attention, and the green and blue line would be the effects of spatial attention. And the frontal eye field does show effects of feature attention in that frontal eye field cells do seem to know where the thing is that you're looking for, even when you're not attending their spatial. That's been known for some time. It's a mysterious, how do they do this? Where does that information come from? Because they don't have any feature selectivity themselves, so they must be getting that information some, right? Um, VPA also has, this, has both spatial attention effects and feature attention effects. Okay, so, and they happen all about the same time. So, Maybe the VPA is the source, but who knows? Okay, so that, to, do, to, to test that, you've got to do a causal experiment. So what Narcisse de Pichot did was he deactivated the VPA and then measured the effects behaviorally and then measured the effects on cells in the frontal eye fields. So here he's um, looking at the effects of the mucinal deactivation of the, of the VPA. And these are the, um, the, the behavioral data pre and post injections. Um, and here we're looking at number of saccades to find the target, and here we're looking at errors. Let's just look at errors for a minute. You can see these are errors in the contralateral field, which are much larger than when the animal is looking for it in the other hemifield, and, 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 and extends to the midline as well. And then and there's also, it takes the animal more saccades to find the target if it's in the field contralateral to the deactivated EPA. Okay, so that's good. So behaviorally, the DPA seems to play some role. But now the really key thing was deactivating the VPA and recording in the frontal eye field. So this is the frontal eye field, the same cells before and after the deactivation. Here's the effects of feature attention, here's the effects of spatial attention. And after you deactivate the VPA, the effects of spatial attention stay, but the effects of feature attention go away. And so this to us would be the evidence that the VPA is supplying that information to the frontal eye fields about what it is you're looking for and where it is in the array. And that's the information that the frontal eye field cells use to direct your eyes to that stimulus. Does that make sense? So that's what we think the, um, the um, so it's, it's not just that this, what we think could be the equivalent of the IFJ in monkey, it's not just that it supplies the information that's important for attending the objects when they're superimposed on each other, uh, but we think it's also the information that you use to, know, to, to, to orient to, to move your eyes to the things in the environment that you're looking for. You've got to know, you can't, you've got to know not only that it's there, but you've got to know where it is, right? You've got to know where is that pink shirt. And then your eyes would normally go, and you would then fixate the pink shirt. And so we think that an interaction between these two areas, that should be VPA there, by the way, 
Um, the interaction between these two areas is going to be really interesting to understand, try to underst understand this, this interaction between spatial and, and feature attention. And also, so I didn't put in, yeah, I didn't put in the right collaborator slide. <laughs> this is assembled at the last minute. But the Emmett Meg experiment was done by Daniel Baldoff. BPA FEF experiment was done by a CC show. I left off the, uh, the initial experiment on IT cortex with decoding, which was done with Ethan Myers and Tom Kojo and, and Ying Zhang. And I left off the, the V4 FEF experiments that were done with George and Gregorio and uh, Wei Wei Tso uh, and, um, and Steve Gotch. But, you know, so those are the people who actually did all that work. And I hope um, this has uh, caused you to become interested in attention. Any other questions? Um, yeah. If you would were to work in a choice from tonight, would you get similar behavioral effects in, in a visual search? If you deactivate the frontal eye field? Instead of, instead of uh, EPA, like, do, are they, do they defer behaviorally? In terms of what they, no, you not do it? Right. Um, so, um, it's actually a little um, puzzling about the deactivation of the frontal eye fields. Uh, in the Musimo, so um, there is a Musimo experiment from Tier and Bohr that um, showed that there were um, behavioral effects just at the spot in the visual field where you did the VP, but, sorry, the FEF deactivation, but it didn't have any effects back in D4, which is puzzling. Uh, we've done it's an experiment that's just about to come out, a lesion in the, um, that included the frontal eye fields. And there, uh, it did affect the cells back in D4. So that's going to need to be sorted out. We're doing an experiment now uh, in collaboration with Ed Boyton using optogenetics to try to deactivate the frontal eye fields in very precise periods of time during a memory-guided saccade task. And that's showing work that's being done uh, by Leah Acker, uh, who's a joint student with Ed and myself. Um, that um, the frontal eye field plays an important role at every time period of that task. In the initial encoding of, the, of where the stimulus is during the memory delay and then the final targeting of that stimulus by the saccade. So I think there is, I think there's a parallel uh, behavioral uh, function of the FEF, but we just need to sort out the details. Somebody else has their hand up? Yeah. Uh, I just kind of want to make sure I understood the big picture uh, is what's possibly going on is the IFJ is sending uh, signals to like the FFA uh, to hold it at this depolarized state that's almost like near hypo, hy near the threshold, I guess, so that these neurons can easily synchronize. Yeah. So, so I, you know, this is all at this point. You know, it's a combination of of sort of theoretical speculation, <coughs> hand waving, you know, having done you know like all the causal experiments, right? But our interpretation of the results is that it's not just that the, 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 the IFJ cells uh, you know are maintaining a chronic level of activity and just keeping the the uh, let's say the FFA polarized during the phase test, but that the activity is actually has some oscillatory component to it, and that they're the, and, and that oscillation, their oscillations are synchronized so that when the IFJ does send information back, it's sort of hitting those FEF, FFA cells at this time when they're most receptive to getting an input. So basically, they're, they're all being, both areas, the cells are being more depolarized during this trial, so they're more likely to respond to a stimulus that you've been cued to attend to. But, but the cells, or speculation is, the cells are making use of this oscillatory synchrony to facilitate just what you're saying, facilitate that response. Because in the end, what you want is that response to the sensory stimulus. You want response to faces to be really high when you're doing the face task and vice versa for the place task. Yeah? Are the EPA cells selected Yeah, I showed that. That's, they're the intermediate. Yes. Yeah, that's right. In fact, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show this right. I didn't, I didn't uh, point it out. But that, if let's say, let's say a, a VPA cell responds best to a shoe, so the activity will be high 
Oh, it, it depends on where the receptive field is. But if it, if it falls within the receptive field, it might be high uh, when you first present it as a Q, and then it might be maintained during the delay. But then actually those cells tend to have a higher firing rate throughout the whole trial that the animal's searching for their preferred feature. And so, so when their preferred feature does occur, so they're already primed to give a larger response to it. And Yeah, um, we don't know for sure, but yeah, you can imagine that if you are attending, not to, okay. I mean, the ability to show the experiment that you feel much because it just affects the visual field. Yeah. So, no, we didn't. Oh, in the, in the visual search test, that's right, you do have them throughout the visual field. There's a lot of experiments, behavioral experiments, in which people have shown that if you, even if you are attending to a feature at a particular location, it kind of spreads through the visual field. Um, why that would be with DPA cells that have receptive fields, it's a little hard to know. Um, but, um, yeah, it could be that you just activate the whole DPA in that case. I don't know. Um, I, the other thing I, I could have, um, I didn't talk about, but, but I might have, which is that if you go just in front of what we're calling DPA, then you go like into classic prefrontal cortex. And that means the cells like do things you don't understand. They, they just do stuff, like they respond in one task and not another task. Or they respond at one part of the trial, another, uh, they do the kinds of things that people describe for, for PFC. And if you deactivate them, then you're really impaired. And so, even though they don't make any sense, you need them for some reason. <laughs> so there's obviously a lot of interesting things going on in that cortex that so we have to figure out. Yeah? Is there a proposal for sort of what's causing the phase locking? Is it pulvinar or sort of a higher level area? Or? Well, I mean, why, um, I mean the obvious um, thing that and some people have, have modeled this is that if you have you know, two groups of cells that are anatomically connected and one starts going into an oscillation, you will get phase coupling uh, just because of the anatomical connection. Oh, I didn't bring my, I could have brought my my hardware demonstration. I really should have done that. I have, so I, 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 I saw this demonstration uh, at a talk I was at in a meeting in Germany, and it was so good, I had to physically reproduce it. And, and what, what, they, the, what this person showed in the video was, um, they had a, a set of um, metronomes, uh, and they put them on a board on, sitting on two soda cans. And um, if, you, if they're not sitting on the board on soda cans, and you have a whole bunch of metronomes going at the same frequency, but at random phase, of course, nothing changes. But once you put them on this board, and so that there's a, if, if one you know, oscillates a bit, it tends to influence the other ones. And after a short period of time, when it starts off as random oscillations, actually goes, all goes into phase synchrony. They all start, or they're in exactly the same phase with each other. Um, and so that's just, the basic idea is it just comes out through the connectivity. But you don't need something else. 